brother saw what I was working with, like he and his wife. And oh no, she didn't come. He and my niece visited, and um, my niece always comes straight to my room to play with my crystals. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and so he followed her back here and saw like I had a setup on my floor, like my desk was my yoga mat, and he was like, "Uh, do you want a desk?" And I was like, no, no, that's okay. That's okay. You know, like martyr syndrome. I don't need anything. I'm good on the floor. <laughs> like my back hunched over. And he sent me, and yeah, he ordered a desk from Wayfair and had it sent. So now I have a new desk. I look out at this willow tree that I love. Oh. So it's working. Mm -hmm. It's working. Definitely. That's awesome. That's so nice of him. Yeah. 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 That's very nice when your family sees that you could benefit from something. Not and it's, honest, yeah. and it's, it was such a huge shift in our relationship too, because I have been, had been craving support from him ever since I left my corporate job and began this path because I had, oh, he's my oldest brother. I always admired him. But his path and his identity attachments are very different because he went to business school and is a managing director at JP Morgan. Yeah, yeah. Everything about us, like he's aligned, he's got to be, he's got to be aligned with his job and his corporation or mm -hmm. else it'd be excruciating to have that as his avenue for providing for his family. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, I'm out here being like, Fuck the pipelines, fuck fossil fuels. Oh, pardon my language. Um, <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> We're all adults here, <laughs> right? If you guys have your kids watching, I mean, honestly, I, I should be in a group called Bad Moms, but I refuse to be in a group that is full of bad moms <laughs> because it's too, it's too consuming, too, too, uh, too time consuming, too much time consuming. Um, I swear in front of my kids. I don't know any moms who don't now. Honestly, no, many don't. They're like, oh my God, don't say that. Some of them uh, don't even like uh, the Jesus's name saying, oh Jesus, right? They don't like that being said at all. And I mean, I'm to each their own. If you don't like it, I will respect and I won't do it in front of you. But in my house, <laughs> the way I see it, it's like, um, if a kid has never heard a swear word and then all of a sudden they're outside and they meet someone or they're at school and all they hear swear words coming around everywhere, like, can you imagine what that could do? I can just like, all I see is like them shriveling into like this, like, like paper. You, you take them and you like crush them into your paper. They're like, oh, 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 all these words that hurt me. <laughs> but those that have been trained, they're like, I have another word for you. I have another one for you. I mean, from the level of consciousness that we're at, where, and that we've been working toward with the work we do, where we don't perceive anything as good or bad, right or wrong, and we get to choose what everything means, I just don't. I, I don't think that, I can't imagine that swearing is going to have the same taboo in the future because they're just words and we get to decide. Yeah. Like, that, to me, that's what it is. Like, that's how I see it. It's just a way that we get to express our frustration. Why do we swear? We don't swear because we're, I mean, sometimes we swear because we're excited. It's like, yeah, fuck, that's awesome. Right? Oh, I like swearing for emphasis. <laughs> Me too. I, I think there's an art, like I honestly think there's an art to swearing. I don't, <laughs> and I just, there are words like swears, curse words, bad words. Why would we judge them? They're fun to say. We all love saying like, what the fuck? Come on. <laughs> okay, I, I, I just like thought of an example. I was on vacation with my family and, and another family and they had, they brought their three-year-old and we were sitting outside by the pool and she goes, fucking mosquito. And we're all like, 
what? And then the, her parents just looked at each other and like, there was a mosquito in the hotel room last night. And we're like, oh. And I don't, we made it a big deal. To her, it wasn't a big deal. It was just, that's what the mosquito was worthy of being called to her. <laughs> she knew, you know, she knew that, that we, the mosquito was a bother. Um, so I, I just, if we all didn't stop and look at her, like, what did you just say? She would have no idea that she had said anything that mm -hmm. is not socially acceptable, but who makes it socially acceptable? Society. So if, if we're all like, no, moms can swear. It's fine. Who cares? It's not a big deal. Yeah. So Honestly, this this topic is actually interesting topic because I shared a video in the group with um, a little boy. Um, I guess his dad was recording. You might have seen this video, right? Because it's like all cute and funny, but it's cute and funny because it's it's a child saying it. But if you think about it, it's not cute and funny. So um, the kid is, uh, I can't remember what the kid was doing. He was doing something or drawing something or coloring something. He was doing something. And then his dad um, is saying, you want to go to a park? And then he mumbled something. And then, uh, I mean, long story short, the kid says that they, basically they can't go to the park because of the fucking Chinese. Right, the kid says fucking Chinese, and I mean it's cute because it's like the fucking mosquito. The kid doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know what those words mean. He doesn't understand any of that. But the whole point behind, because I mean the kid doesn't understand, but the whole point behind him saying such a comment that is very racist that goes to show you what goes on in the house, what goes on in the hotel room, right? In the hotel room, the parents were saying fucking mosquito, bit them, it probably ate them alive until they killed it. But here a parent is saying something that is offensive. And the kid is really, oh. sometimes they hear it from oh, parents. I don't want to save that kid. <laughs> I don't live with these people. Uh. That's, I mean, that gets imprinted. That's part of that kid's story now. That that story, that becomes a story. What, yeah. what that kid hearing his parents say. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, because to think about, um, like there was a couple of comments that my daughter made that when we were out but i don't have those types of conversations with people i don't talk like that so it might have been that something she might have overheard in on the tv or on a show that i i had watched at that at that point uh, which made me really like embarrassed and uncomfortable because like oh my god it's not coming from me i don't say things like that so what happened was uh, mila was about three and a half or four years old because she only yeah she was about four and she she pretty much started speaking when she was she started jk so she was three in like three years and eight months so she started speaking around that age and i was walking with her to a doctor's office so i was pregnant with ethan so she must have been about um yeah she was about almost four years old so i was walking to a doctor's office with with my daughter in the stroller and there was a oh an obese man walking in front of us far distance in front of us and at, at that point i was watching these uh shows um what are they called like like 600 pounds and the people can't get out of the house and they want to lose weight and they want to get healthy i was watching those shows because to me they're motivational right um and, and very educational because i get to learn of how i can I can get fitter and healthier. Did I apply it? Not necessarily. <laughs> uh, but anyways, long story short, she sees this man from far away and she screams, mommy, mommy, look, he has a big butt. And I'm like, oh. I felt so ashamed because I never, ever talk like that. I never point out things in people. 
even when I point things out, it's encouraging, right? So I was just like, oh my God. And like, there's no way that he did not hear me. And then we were in the elevator with him. And at that point, like as we were walking, I'm trying to explain to her, like have a conversation with her and teach her. And I mean, they don't really understand at that point, right? Because she just made a comment, something that she heard, not from me and not from my husband, because we don't talk like that, but from a TV, perhaps, maybe a show we watched, or maybe even a song. I like big butts and I cannot lie, right? That's a song I always, always listen to. And I mean, she points it out. And then I, I taught her not to point things out in people because we're, we're all different and yet we're the same right and I don't like how he might feel so she's she's very like sensitive to feelings and emotions and we were in an elevator and I was just like oh my god oh my god like I don't know what to say I don't know where to look I don't know how to feel but I was I was covered in sweat the ex- yeah I bet. <laughs> But the experience, you derive the value from the experience in teaching your daughter empathy. Like, that's amazing that you're able to take that experience and then talk about how it might make others feel when we point out things about them. Yeah. Like, I, don't, I, don't have, I don't remember really getting those kinds of lessons growing up. Well, maybe I did. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if I did. I can't remember, right? My childhood... Um, I mean, my childhood, I don't remember very much from my childhood. And I, I, I believe it's because I was a wild child and I was very, very active and I got yelled at a lot. And, um, I got, I remember sitting in corners a lot. So those things I remember sitting in corners because those were honestly like, they were fun times for me because I got to irritate my parents even more. (laughs) Sorry. <laughs> uh, but anyways, um, I got yelled at a lot when we go through like, it's like traumatic experiences in a way, right? So it blocks out a lot of memories, um, and that's why I, I mean, I find myself yelling at my kids sometimes, and right away I'm like, no, 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 don't, right? And it's not like it's gonna stop right overnight, but little by little, um, it will become non-existent. Um, and I mean, Mila did learn from these conversations because we had quite a few of them. That's just one that I, I vaguely remember, um, or not vaguely, vaguely, just a little bit remember. This is the one that I remember a lot of. (laughs) And another one was, and this is, she was trying to be very empathetic but it did not come across that way. So this is a story of Mila and the midget. (laughs) That's what I'm going to call it. So we were at Walmart and there was one time we were at Walmart and she saw this uh, little woman and she goes, mommy, mommy, why is she so little? And Ethan was with me as well. So he got to learn, right? Um, This was, I would say about two years ago. And I explained to her a little bit about midgets, right? And, and that they're just like you and I, they're normal people, just a little bit different size and blah, 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 right? Explained to her uh, what she needed to hear in that moment in time. And then about a week later, we were at a cashier. um, And so this lady comes up, the midget, and I don't like to use that word, a little person. I'm gonna call her a little person. I don't like that word midget, and I have a feeling that they don't like it as well. Um, so a little person, she she comes up to the cashier, and I think she's like in the managerial role, so she was getting some cash from the cashier, and my daughter, being the sweet thing that she is, she goes, I love midgets. You guys are the best. And I'm just like, buddy <laughs> was there, but I was not. Again, <laughs> I was covered in sweat. Talking about it, I'm like sweating right now. Just in case like a little person was watching and listening. I'm sorry, guys. It makes me like so uncomfortable. Like I have like tears starting to come through because I feel myself and I feel that person in that moment and I'm just like 
oh my God, all I felt was shame and guilt. And it was another learning lesson for her, right? And it's like, I mean, kids have no filters. She was trying to do something nice and I knew that. And that's why I'm like, I had no words at that moment. I'm just like, don't make eye contact. Don't make eye contact. <laughs> I don't exist. So I'm not here. Mm. But like, so something that was coming through as you were um, describing, like how you felt in that moment, was just the separation of self. Like in those types of moments where there's any label, as innocent and well-meaning as it is. Mm it can cause separation of self, like the, the soul, the spirit is just like, okay, bye. And the body and mind are just left there. Like what just happened? Like it, it, it reminded me of um, like that feeling that you were describing. It reminded me of this time when my boss, came, former boss came into my office and was like, that email is not an action item for you. Um, I just wanted your name on it because that the that woman is jewish and so he wanted the last name goldberg it at like cc'd and in that moment like i just stared at i stared at him and nodded just kind of like my body was there but my spirit had left and my soul had left they were like oh this feels weird bye and it it didn't, it took me a while to bring it back into my body and figure out like, what just happened? What was that feeling? Like, wh why did I like, it, it felt like, um, like disassociation, you know? Yeah. Like we're not here right now. <laughs> well, yeah. It's almost like you, you, the way I would describe it, it's like my daughter was standing right here. I was standing right here, but I was standing right here and just like watching Yana, Mila, cashier, and a little person. And then just like thinking, what the fuck do I do now? What do I say? How can I get out of here really quickly? <laughs> with less damage because enough damage has been done and all i said to me i'm like mila we don't talk like that we'll we'll have a conversation later right and it's like and again like that sounds so like parental and it's almost like telling her bad 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 mila but she wasn't Right. right right so it's like i had to say something to acknowledge it but at the same time i feel like now looking back it's like i kind of created fears like you did something bad when you talk about it you're in trouble even though she she was not and that's not the conversation we had because she wasn't in trouble because i told her like good job for acknowledging good job for noticing for giving love and appreciation right for trying to be nice but there's a different way and the way would be a different way would be for you not to point out i don't want to say a flaw but that's the word that comes to mind right um to point out how the, the person is different don't point that out just talk to them like they're a normal person. That's all they want, right? That's, what, that's all we all want. If I had a big yeah. ass mole on my face, I don't, I don't want you to talk to my mole. I want you, I want you to talk to me. That's, I, I think this is just part of the complications that arise with language. Like we humans need to apply language and concepts to everything. So we're constantly perceiving through conception conceptualizing rather than just experiencing each other like if we're just experiencing each other there's no way we would know that there are these differences that would even come to mind to be pointed out yeah yeah um it, it would be much easier if we could just say 
what we want to say. But then again, we have to be politically correct. Because we might understand like you and I and then some of the viewers might be uh, might understand um that words don't have a meaning until you give them a meaning right 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 but for the rest of the world which is i would say just like an estimated guess 80 85 percent of the world or let's say 80 to round it off nicer 80 percent of the world is very sensitive when it comes to words and very politically correct whatever that means i mean i'm i'm super sensitive when it comes to words like words of affirmation are my no, are my number one love language and la like language to me is so important and that's why i think that if we redirect language instead of focusing so much on labels and differences like our language is built to focus on differences and concepts and constructs and if, it, if we could just redirect it to focus on how we feel and with a sense of clarity and so i'm, I'm gonna tell you i know that for anyone else watching it might be confusing but for us since we are energy leadership practitioners, the way I'm kind of seeing it as, so the average energy level of the world is level two. So our entire lexicon is filled with fear and control and forcefulness. And so then the way we judge and project is through that language. So I'm kind of seeing it like mitigating that when we mitigate that those lower levels of energy in general, the language itself shifts. Mm -hmm. Because when we're speaking from the higher frequencies, levels five through seven, level four through through seven, the language is our, our communication is completely different and there is no judgment. Mm -hmm. So, I forgot where I got started, why I got started on that topic, on energy. Sensitivity of words and the energy levels. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thanks for bringing me back. Um, Welcome back. <laughs> I mean, it happens because uh, <laughs> the morning ritual. <laughs> um, oh, I miss my morning ritual. <laughs> it's been a while. I mean, I, every morning I'm like, all right, maybe not this morning. And then I'll, I'll sit down to write. And I'm like, you know what would really make this writing flow? <laughs> I know what <it> helps. <laughs> yeah, I know. And then that writing, it's like reading it back sometimes. Like, where did I get that from? It's not from this world. How, how did that get on my piece of paper? That doesn't make any sense. It makes perfect sense, but it doesn't make any sense. That's, that's not me. <laughs> yeah. Whose words are those? Yeah. <laughs> that's what we're here for. Like, that's exactly why I'm here. Why I'm here. Love that morning ritual because I'm just a channel. I, I and that opens me up for whatever wants to flow through it opens me up so I can just be an open channel and it's yeah. just my hand see and the reason why I, I stopped is because I wanted to learn and get better not not learn but get better at being that open channel without anything mm -hmm. and I mean it's easier now than it was when I when I stopped, which was like which was February 18th to be exact. Um, I'm keeping track of the days and <laughs> and the numbers. It's like almost I think, two months. Yeah, uh, almost two months, and um, I have my moments when I miss it, but at the same time, it's like okay, well, what can I do instead? Mm -hmm. Right, and because. I mean, I had my own reasons on top of the, that reason why I wanted to stop, right? I just wanted to experience life with nothing. Yeah. 
now like even when i drink alcohol i don't enjoy it like i'll i, I prefer shots over drinks <laughs> it's just just get it in there Let's, you're, you're russian. <laughs> very russian <laughs> um but even then um it's it's a different experience right now i can like i can feel the difference and i don't enjoy it as much mm-hmm. yeah and there was a couple of times what happens is so if i worked out a lot the day before or that morning and i drink i kid you not it feels like the alcohol is attacking yep. my muscles and it's like ripping them to a point where the pain is like it's usually in my shoulders like in my upper back my shoulders and it shoots up into my neck and it's like shoots all the way like all around into my head and i get like a massive 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 migraine um mm-hmm. and i know part of it as well is because alcohol dehydrates you and exercise dehydrates you so might already be dehydrated so putting alcohol in there and that's another reason i'm like nope no, no, no. I would much rather do my workouts in the morning and feel the soreness and not be paralyzed and have a difficult time going to sleep afterwards. I, I want to point out, I, I know one of the questions you ask your clients pretty regular, regularly is how does it make it feel in your body? Mm-hmm. And it just, what you just shared shows that how effective listening to your body really is. Like, feeling that your body's response to alcohol and then recognizing my body doesn't like this and treating your body with empathy and treating it like it's your home it's your home and you it shows that you're treating it with respect as the temple that it is Mm -hmm. so i just think that that's super cool that you were able to take that lessen the way that it makes your body feel and that was motivation enough to be like "Mm, i'm not doing this again maybe water (laughs) yeah with lemon yeah lemon water i don't even like regular water anymore (laughs) lemon water is so good was that a whole lemon in there uh yes it was a pain in the ass to get the straw inside (laughs) um Honestly, the way I do my lemon water, the way I do my lemon water is like, I put one lemon in, um, and then to like today I'm reusing up the same lemon that was, that's been in the water. It's like fermenting and marinating in there a little bit. Um, and then the other one I put in last night, but both of them will be coming out today and I'll be putting a new one in. Um, and I know that lemon water, alkalines our body right and that's honestly it was from Wim Hof that I heard that even more and the um the whole topic of having an alkaline body meaning a healthy body that's where like he kind of like hit it home for me and um, I don't know if he was the one talking about lemon water, but I know with him, like his breathing technique that he teaches, that's what kind of alkalines the body, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You broke up a bit for me at the end there. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. um, but I was just going to ask, um, since you were breaking breaking up a bit, I'm not sure if you explained it, but just for anybody who doesn't know, I was wondering if you would like to explain a bit more about what alkaline means. Um, from what I have learned, alkaline, it's, it's basically, um, how do I put it? So the way that I understood it and the way that it had triggered it for me was this. If you are feeling unhealthy in any way, so foggy brain, mind, 
feeling tired, groggy, exhausted, you have muscle aches, cramps, uh, you have leaky gut. I mean, it shows up different ways. Um, if you are overweight, usually that means that your body is not alkaline. And if you do work on your body and you uh, balance the alkaline levels in your body, then all of that will go away. That's how I would explain because that's how I got it. That's how I understood it. That's how it, that's how the message went into me. And I was like, I want that. Now it makes sense why an alkaline body is a healthy body. Mm -hmm. How did you get it? Like, how do you, how would you explain it? Um, it Imagine be different. Yeah. So I grew up with a pool in my backyard. Um, My dad owned a pool, pool company when I was growing up so um so I got I was like super into taking care of the pool because I was watching him do it and I and you measure the pH and um like the pH balance in the pool it's like basically measuring the water quality and um and I forget exactly which side was which uh, or what the um like the way we measured it you'd put a couple of drops of like ph and i forget what the other one is um but it's it indicates like what the pool needs Mm -hmm. and so i kind of pictured it like an alkaline body is those perfect balances of ph and um what is, is it I think well, it's, a, it's some sort yeah, of yes, 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 exactly, um, and yes. Yeah, so that kind of is how how it hit home. Like, I was obsessed with taking care of the pool. I would check that. Like, I'd see like a little bit of like cloudiness or ma- or like a little pink algae cloud, and I'm like, we got to check the pH balance. So <laughs> that's how I it hit and resonated for me. It's like, okay, well. If I was that dedicated to the pool, keeping the pool water clean, I can certainly do take that same level of care with my body. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, that's that's yes. kind of how, how alkaline, like learning about it, made made its way into my integration. Mm-hmm. It's all about balancing your body and lemon. And honestly, like now that I think back, it would make sense why I was such a like healthy kid, I would say, running around, so much energy, feeling good, never a muscle cramp or an ache. And that was up until I started thinking birth control. So birth control did mess me up big time. But up until yep. then, I used to eat lemons. I would take a lemon, like half a lemon. Now I'm like, Julie, really? <laughs> just picture eating. I mean, that's the best way to visualize anything. If you can visualize eating yourself, uh, if you can visualize yourself eating a lemon, you can visualize anything. I'm more like Julie. But I would take a lemon and I would just like eat it just like that. Just like that. And sometimes I would like nibble on the skin as well because it will be like a little that's bit. That's really good for you. The yeah. lemon, lemon rind. Yeah, so now thinking back, that I was doing that naturally. I was making my body alkaline naturally. You were intuiting what your body needed. Mm-hmm. And it's, I remember my mom always saying, like, oh, my God, it's so sour. How do you do that? That just encouraged me even more. <laughs> Sours and bitters are good for us. Yeah. Um, you, it's... I've got to follow this train of thought because it is the third time that this has come up in three days for me. Mm-hmm. Um, like three different, three different women, topic of birth control. And so this is the third time in a row that a woman has spoken about what birth control has done. Yep. And like, it, it just, I felt like I had to point it out because it's so fucked up. Like, yeah, 
it's so fucked up what birth control has done to uh, to all of us. I remember I mentioned um, there was a course that I was taking called Hormone Balancing Your Hormones. Okay, so I did that course. It was like a free course for I think like 14 days. So I watched it, I took notes. I don't have my notes here with me, but she was talking about one of the days was about birth control. And it affects your body and your mind in so many ways. One of the things that now doctors are starting to look for when it comes to anxiety and depression is if you took birth control um, as a young adult or as a child. And I mean, I did. Um, and I only took uh, birth control for about a year. And I can speak from my personal experience. Um, it messed up my body in so many ways it threw my hormones out of balance now got, having gone through the course i can i can see what ha, what it, what effects it had on my body um and the mind and everything so you know all the things that i mentioned how the alkaline in your body can help or diminish all those all of those are attached to the post birth control taking, right? Your brain is at a whack. You're, uh, I was depressive, oh, depressed. <laughs> um, and I giggle because I, I remember those times and it's either you, you nervously laugh or you cry about it. So I nervously laugh. <laughs> um, so I remember that, uh, the anxiety and panic attacks. Um, mm -hmm. I remember that and feeling uh, honestly, the weight in the body itself, like be, being unable to shed the weight. Um, and it's not just the weight, but getting back to the shape that I was like, to me, honestly, that has been one of the biggest struggles. Um, yes, I got to my goal weight, um, somewhat the goal weight that I had at that time when I was doing this weight loss system and I got to that goal weight. And then now it's like, it's either I'm, I'm like going between five pounds, five pounds up, five pounds down, and then not being able to go down, uh, to the weight that I, I w want to be at and the shape that I want to be at. Um, but anyways, like, honestly, to me, there was a lot more and it's like some scary stuff as well. Like affects your thyroid as well. I mean, that's it's every, like I, I was on it from the time I was 17 till I was about 25 or 26. And I went off of it because I was also addicted to Adderall at the time. And I went to the gyno to get my birth control refilled and she wouldn't give me the the prescription because my blood pressure was so high and she was like it would be illegal for me to refill this prescription and i wouldn't tell her why my like i knew my blood pressure was so high because i had taken adderall earlier that day and i was and like pounded coffee and was just like racing and like i was like get me out of this fucking doctor's office like i gotta go to work and, um, and instead of, I just took it as a sign when she wouldn't refill that prescription. And, um, I was like, all right, I'm just going to not use birth control anymore. And my whole life and my whole perception changed. Like I, even my attraction to my partner at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, I would hmm. wonder. Hey, Ethan. What? I have this. What is? What's on your head? It's just connected to this. I can show you. Yeah, let's see it. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. I want one. Amazon. <laughs> oh my god. I got seventy in a wool. Seventy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. nah. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, that's for like hand eye coordination for boxing. 
Yeah. You kind of like froze there. So what I was saying is like, it, that's for like hand eye coordination and boxing. So that way they, they become better at video games as well. <laughs> that is cool. Like, I'm not kidding. I would, I would also try to get a with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but watching these YouTube videos, like how these people do it and, um, they can just hitting and hitting and hitting and hitting and for min like minutes at a time, nonstop, because they just get so good at it. Get in the rhythm. Yeah. Um, the other thing um, with post birth control, migraines. Migraines? Yeah. You can end up having like major migraines afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know my, my cramps came back, like, with a vengeance, um, but it, but then, then cannabis was legalized, so, um, I was all right, yeah, <laughs> I was all right. Just, the other one is not. One's what? One is natural, the other one is not. And it's, and one is, has a symbiotic relationship with us, it always has, so. Like we have an endocannabinoid system, so specifically for the cannabis plant. Well, and and other and other plant medicines, yeah. um, like cacao, also attaches to those same receptors. Mm -hmm. ah, cacao. Well, you get to witness my cacao on Friday because my heart just was so open on Friday. I could not help the tears. I could not help anything that was coming out of my heart through my mouth. Um, to a point where yesterday, I don't know if you guys had the cacao ceremony or no, not. We, we skipped it yesterday. Yeah. But, and then I saw that there was like, uh, the creative zone as well. And I was in a place where I'm like, no, you know what? I need to focus on myself and I need to do something that is going to help me to feel like I move myself forward. So what I did, um, which I actually started telling you uh, earlier before we started recording and then I just like shifted completely and I forgot. Um, I guess this is, this is the reason why. Um, so what I did for myself basically um, is I showed you the Gremlin project that I did and I showed it in, in, the, in my group, in the Empathy Unicorn Academy group, the, I did the video before going to school to present the project. So of what the gremlin is and I kind of talked about it and I showed and everything, but on a piece of paper, right? It's not big, one of those like big white sheets um, because I love to create things with my hands. And that's what I wanted to do yesterday. I wanted to work with my hands and just be, right? Those are the times that I can just be, it's like, it's so meditative to me. I like, I kid you not, I was just, so what I did was the, um, there was this really long piece of board that my husband had. I asked them to cut it in half and then to put wooden pieces behind it to make like a, a picture out of it, right? So um, I sanded it because I'm a perfectionist. I like everything nice and neat and smooth. I wanted the smooth edges everywhere, even in the back, on <laughs> the, the back panels. So I did that. I sanded it. And then I'm like, I'm gonna, I want to stain it. So I stained the front of it. And then I'm like, I'm going to stain the back of it. Nobody's going to see the back, but I know it's there. So I stained the back of it in a different color. And then uh, my son's bed that we made almost two years ago, that my husband made almost two years ago in his room. It's like, a, it's attached to the walls. It's like a bunk bed, right? So it's on top, the whole top. And that's what I saw in your picture. Yeah, it's like the whole across um, yeah. the room from wall to wall is his bed. And... So I went to town, um, I sanded his bed again, especially some areas, right? Cause I wanted to get rid of all the, the stamps that they put on the wood. Um, and then I stained it. I spent basically when I was done, I don't even know what time I started because time has like, time loses all meaning to me. I did not eat lunch. Um, I didn't even feel hungry. Um, I just drank my lemon water here and there and everywhere. Um, by the time I was done, it was like 7.40 ish in the evening. My husband's like, okay, are you done yet? Are you done yet? We're about to have dinner. I'm like, are you done dinner? Yes. Okay. I'm coming. <laughs> and I'm like, just a little, little piece. So I finished everything. Like the, the top where he sleeps, 
the whole entire railing. Um, so the top he sleeps, the whole entire railing and underneath the bed. I was going to do it in chalk paint, in black chalk paint, but then I'm like, too much work. It's so much easier with this rag and I'm already here. Might as well just do it all in one color. Um, and it's underneath the bed, it's gonna be dark anyway. So I just did it in that because my biggest concern was the stamps that are underneath the bed, uh, that if I did it with stain, that they might show through. And luckily when I did it with stain, because I tested a few areas, I didn't see the stamp underneath. So I'm like, oh, perfect. I don't have to do it with black chalk paint, right? Because I just didn't want to sand that area either. Um, so that was my day. That's how I decided I was going to spend my day on myself, even though it's not necessarily for me, but it is because this is a project that we started two years ago. And this is goes to everyone out there as well that has a project that they had started <laughs> and they are feeling guilty and they're feeling shamed and just honestly feeling bad that they have not completed it. Even if it takes you two years to finish it, don't beat yourself up, go and do it. Yesterday was the right time for me. I did it. I feel good. Today is going to be sealing it. <laughs> right? Um, Steal it today. Congratulations. Like that, I think it's in one of the Law of Being discs where Bruce talks about like if you give yourself a bunch of books to read and they're just take like, they're taking up space and you're not actually moving forward reading them. Yeah. It frees up energy to just move them out of the way altogether, like put them back on the bookshelf and stop, you know, beating yourself up for, because every time you see it, you're going to beat yourself up. Be, like I should read it. I should read it. And so I can only imagine having that taking up any kind of energetic space for two years um yeah. like how free it is so i salute you yana thank you Congrats. congratulations <laughs> thank you how does it feel to have it have that much of that work done behind you um honestly i'm not gonna lie i thought it would feel better uh because i'm a human being the transparency and that's why I'm not gonna lie I'm not gonna pretend like I'm this awesome human being who gets it done after two years I still feel a little bit of that guilt and shame it's like it's like you finished it in um what three four hours right I finished it in three four hours why couldn't I carve out that time earlier you know what I mean? Kind of like beating myself up for the past mistakes, so to speak. Um, but then shifting back and saying it wasn't the right time. You wouldn't have done such an awesome job, right? You wouldn't have enjoyed doing it at that time. You wouldn't have had time perhaps to do it because it, it did take a chunk out of my day um, to do it. And I did it when I felt like it. Even though like every time I would walk into the room, I see that bed and it's unfinished. Subconsciously, mm -hmm. I would know that I need to finish it. Uh, I was like a constant reminder of this white looking wood standing there. And because I knew it was going to be, um, it's that I like to get things done. Like I would imagine most people are do it. An hour, all of it is done, right? Start a business and an hour, your business is up and running and everything is peachy, everything is awesome. But it's not the reality, right? When it comes to this bed, that's also not the reality. It's not realistic for me to sit down and do it in an hour, right? Um, so even though I kind of still feel bad about it, I remind myself that I'm going to feel good about it now. Right? I'm not going to put it off and say, I'm going to feel good about when I'm completely done. Because that was the thought that went through my mind when, when it's all um, 
what's the word sealed when it's sealed and it's done then i'm gonna feel good no why wait to feel good right because that's what we, we help our clients to understand that why put off those feelings that we want to have i'll be happy one syndrome that's that's what it is right and i don't want to wait until again. destination addiction exactly and and this is where it, the it's like mixed emotions and feelings i feel good that i got this far and i'm still kind of like surprised and shocked at myself that i managed to do it yesterday and i was like so focused and i was in it did not get distracted um and just i was i was just one with the bed i was one with the stain um maybe i was just getting high off the fumes as well <laughs> um <clears throat> Yeah, so I mean, is it is mine freezing a lot for you? Yeah, mm, okay, a little bit more than normal because, um, also depends where you are in the room. Well, also, I don't know, like the weather here is really wild, so I'm wondering if that has something to do with it. Um, it might be, yeah, cool. yeah. could definitely depend on the room, but I think. Did I hear you say that you were one with the bed? Yeah, I was one with the bed. <laughs> That's what I, was, I was hoping I heard. <laughs> with, the, with the stain. I was one with the fumes of the stain. <laughs> See, that's, and that brings me back to what I was hearing all along as you were describing your experience. Well, there are a couple of things that came to mind. One is that as you were describing it, it just sounded like level six energy to me, mm -hmm. like your experience of time. You know, time stands still when you're just in the flow, like even forgetting to eat, um, like that, and like not even feeling the need to eat because you're just caught up in in doing something creative, which is another thing that came to mind. You're in a state of creativity. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that came to mind is, um, you know, when you mentioned choosing that project over joining the creative zone call mm -hmm. we started the creative zone call with pretty much um like one of the uh one of the leaders in, in the um group was late to joining and he was like yeah i was um he mentioned he was he had a um like long meditative rejuvenating shower and um so we're like that's exactly what you needed to do so we had had a talk about how important it is to listen to whatever it is like listen to our bodies listen to our self care and, and do what we need to do and fill up on that energy mm -hmm. because if we show up depleted what we have to offer is not going to be as potent so for you to take that time and tap into that level six energy, which is an inexhaustible resource, was important for you at that time. And now you, as much as I do, do hear your um, negotiation with the gremlin, who, your gremlin apparently is like, why didn't you start this earlier? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's like, see, you know, uh, even though that gremlin is there, I can feel your overall energy is, is net fuel. Yeah, yeah, because I choose not to listen to her because she's tiny and I'm big, <laughs> right? Because she resides in this in a smaller part of my brain now as opposed to before. Because before she took over the entire brain yeah yeah over all the functions all the feelings all the emotions she was in control and she's no longer in control and i i think it is such an, an important gremlin to that specific voice why didn't you start this earlier you should have started this earlier i think when it comes to creativity that is such a common gremlin like I know for me personally, that has been a block 
throughout my life, anytime I've had this inkling to learn how to play guitar. And then I think, well, it's too late now. Like you're too old. Old people can't learn new things. And <laughs> you're old. <laughs> I mean, any excuse. And the gremlin is just doesn't want to be bad at it. The gremlin hates being my gremlin. At least hates being bad at shit. And mine too. Like hates like not knowing how long it's gonna take to be good at it. <laughs> that unknown, you know. And so that's been a block with so many creative pursuits that I now, when I look at a guitar, I still hear, I still hear Smalls, my grandma Smalls, being like, oh, well, you should have started when you, you were 12, then you'd be nasty by now. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'll, I'll be nasty when I decide. <laughs> And I think so many of us with this time, this enforced pause that we have might be uncovering and remembering all the things that we wanted to learn, that the soul is like, this, 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 learn this. And maybe our gremlins were like, you didn't start when you were young enough, so there's no point now. Yeah. And so I just hope for anyone listening and watching who can relate to these gremlins that we can offer you some um tips we can offer tips for muting the gremlin mm -hmm. i know in my group in the path warrior training i shared my own notes um like I'll, I'll sometimes write it out my conversation with the gremlin so basically um I, and yana i think you experienced this in ma too mm -hmm. the yeah the um what basically what we do is shoot should we just uh, do it? Yeah. Like, okay. Um, do the, the coaching the gremlin exercise. I um, think it'll be month three because we just shared the gremlin and talked about and okay. just, yeah, I think that's going to be in month three, the actual coaching of the gremlin. Okay. We keep telling so us, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. Oh, wait. Okay, so maybe I'll hold off. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but what I will tell for anyone who, who is hoping we'd go through the, the exercise, um, the gremlin is just energy. Yeah. And because everything's just energy. So the gremlin's just energy. It's there because when we were young, it um, was assigned to be our protector, our guardian. And that developed into a very strong ego. And so it's trying to keep us safe. And it's a very strong energy. It's very personal because I don't care what anyone says. We are all sensitive. We're all picking up on, on all the little tones, attitudes around us. So the gremlin, when we're young, picks up on that and remembers what made us feel embarrassed, what made us feel ashamed. Mm -hmm what made us feel defeat and failure and it thinks we didn't like that we're not going to experience that again so we're going to avoid anything that might uh invoke those feelings mm -hmm. rejection um disappointment so it becomes a very strong very personal energy it comes out in thoughts it manifests in thoughts such as who do you think you are? You're not good enough. Um, and <clears throat> so they, those become stories we tell ourselves to keep ourselves blocked. And so what happens is when we start hearing the gremlin more and more with more and more clarity, we hear that, that voice for what it is, just an energy is, is not true. It's inappropriate. What happens is it becomes this generalized reaction that is not no longer appropriate for where we are in our lives. Mm -hmm. We're adults now. We have custody of ourselves now. We it's don't like an old record that no longer is relevant. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So the energy is always going to be there because energy can neither be created nor destroyed but it can be transformed, it can be transmuted, it can be alchemized. 
So what we do is we coach the gremlin through this process by having this internal dialogue with it. So mine's gotten to the point where it's pretty quick. Like when I first began this practice, it was super emotional because I had a face that led to that becoming my gremlin. Like my, my biggest gremlin was your voice doesn't matter. And as, which served a purpose because that's why I am a writer now, because instead of expressing my voice out loud, I would write it down. So you don't, I'd look at my journal, but like, you'll hear me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you'll hear my truth. And, um, but now that I'm on these zoom sessions like this and now that I'm, I'm speaking as a as a coach and an energy consultant my voice matters but that was a really strong gremlin because it was attached to so much trauma mm-hmm. so much rejection so much abuse um and so much alienation for being a weird kid with insight into people's emotions and thoughts um people don't like that <laughs> no <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um so yeah so i learned to keep my mouth shut what it did was i i kept my mouth shut and i got away with it because my family would say to people oh she just should I? and that became my story so as uh how old was i when i went through ipac 31 no 32 33 as a, at 33 years old to um to then confront this gremlin was mind-blowing and to realize that I don't have to believe the lies and I can have a conversation with it and ask it and tell it I appreciate hey thanks for showing up so one of the keys is just recognize that it's there witness it allow it appreciate it just wants it just wants your attention really it's just a child who wants your attention yeah um so recognize it treat it like a child and say hey look gremlin i hear you i know you think that i'm gonna be embarrassed or hurt if i try this um but that kind of protection is no longer needed so i would instead appreciate if you can cheer for me and encourage me mm-hmm. and ask your gremlin you know can you do that and imagine the gremlin saying yes I can do that I'm only here to help and then that and then the new gremlin's message part of the process is you develop a, a new message for the gremlin so the gremlin goodness I believe in you you can do anything you say mind to so imagine that the shift in energy from who do you think you are? You don't matter. Yeah. Your voice doesn't matter. Oh, you should have done this years ago. You know, those heavy emotions, doubt, shame, guilt versus being told you can do it. You got this. Like what kind of emotions is, does that bring up? You know, like hopefulness and inspiration. It, it's encouraging. Mm-hmm. So that energy that is an energy transmutation yeah metabolic to anabolic and that's how we coach our gremlins essentially Mm -hmm. i do remember actually doing that exercise in matu standing with my gremlin project and changing the words and then you step forward in front of everyone and you gotta like stump your foot yeah and say out loud like really loud for everyone to hear behind the wall as well (laughs) the new gremlins message Mm -hmm. and i remember my voice was trembling when i was doing that Mm -hmm. because the gremlin did not like me changing the words (laughs) but since then because the first time is the hardest that's why I wanted to share that part because the first time, the first time a child takes a step, the first time a child walks, the first time a child rides a bike, a two wheel bike, first time you do anything is always going to be hard. 
And if you're doing it the first time and it's not hard, then maybe you're just natural gift and go to the next thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's usually very, very hard the first time to do it. Yeah, well, it's the first time we're confronting that level of attachment. Yeah. We have to our grandma is intense. And that's really, that's really where the pain is. It's in the attachment. The suffering is in the attachment to something that we're going to go of. So to let go of that story that has been keeping us blocked mm -hmm. and playing small, like we don't realize until we start doing this work, we don't realize how attached we are to playing small. Yes. And you know what? That's what I actually felt in that moment when I was changing that message of the gremlins message, I felt attached and I felt like I was resisting and I did not want to let go because it was comfortable. It was familiar. It was safe. And this new one meant that I had to change that I was changing that shit needed to get done and shit was going to be different. And that fear of a no showed up for me. Yes. So in uh, a yeah. second, all of that came in and I'm aware enough to recognize what all of that was and just standing there. And that's where the trembling, that's where it all came from. And I was just like, I, I, I understand what is going on and I don't like it, but I see the purpose. I see the point and as scared as I might be for what's behind there, I'm ready because now I know how to work through it. I know how to go through it and I know how to shift that energy how to transmute that energy how to use that energy as fuel. It, and the more practiced we are in it the intensity decreases and the efficiency increases the efficiency with which we can transmute it like now my gremlin comes up like the example that i used um that i i wrote I, in my journal is deciding to learn how to play the didgeridoo and two days in I heard my grandma be like oh come on you're gonna try this for two days and you're gonna give up like everything else you do and I heard it and and I, I was like shut the fuck up you know like just shut like I've had it like get out of here and but the transmutation was quick because the gremlin and I now ha are like have witty banter. I'm like, come on, like you know we've been through this. And the gremlin's like, oh yeah, 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 totally forgot, my bad. <laughs> and so it's, it's not as painful, it's not as emotional because that that first step we are being confronted with that Marianne Williamson quote that's like our greatest adequate our greatest fear is that we are um some powerful beyond measure is that what it is i think so yeah i think that's how it goes um it is not our our inadequacy but our greatness that most frightens us yeah. some i uh, I, I get my gremlin also anytime i'm about to misquote something my gremlin's like you suck you suck you suck <laughs> mine does too it's like be quiet, be quiet and then the sweats come in <laughs> yep yep but hey but at, at this this i could have paused myself googled it gotten the quote right but instead i was like fine then i suck <laughs> what's the scariest thing that can happen you suck okay yeah yep. all right fine i got the quote wrong nobody cares people yeah. can look it up <laughs> yeah look it up and share it in the group there you go there's your homework part of the homework there you go <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Something good comes out from it. Um, and now I forgot it. Would, <laughs> I get so like. <laughs> um, oh, I remember. Long session. Let's stop going. <laughs> Kids don't cry and beat themselves up on the sack. Why do? When did we start? Kids don't even think they suck. Kids think they're awesome. Yeah. We're kids. We're just big kids. No matter how old you are, you're still a child. Yeah. People don't know everything. We never will. No matter how much we try.
it's, it's just so different when we're kids because we are provided for. We don't have to provide for ourselves. So when we're, when we're learning something new, to us, we have all the time and energy in the world to learn something new because we don't have to think, how am I going to make money from this? Yeah, and now we limit the time. Mm-hmm. And yesterday, I refused to limit the time. Yeah. And that's where, like, see that? <laughs> yes. I was sharing before that I was having inside my head with my gremlin. That, my friends, was how I was coaching the gremlin, how I was talking to the gremlin and shifting the messaging because my tiny was trying to tell me the same thing. You should have done it then. She was shooting all over me, right? Like, should, 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 should. And I told her all the time, I don't shoot on you. Don't shoot on me. Right? Loving my gremlin. I mean, I had lots of hearts on my gremlin pro- project. And what I did, uh, actually, so all the hearts that I used to spray paint, they were uh, made out of like a uh, glass. I had them for so many years. Um, so I put the glass hearts and I spray painted each heart in different color and everything. What I did in class is I gave a piece of my gremlin heart to every classmate and to every teacher that I had there. So everyone got a piece of my gremlin because they contributed to changing and shifting my inner gremlin. And I mean, at first, my grandma was telling me, see, you're weird. You're the only one that did this crazy project. Look at everyone else. Like some people brought a leaf. Some people brought a, a, a little figurine. Some people did this. Some people just found stuff around their house and they called their grandma. And you are so crazy. You went out and you got a whole bunch of stuff and you made me into something shiny and sparkling glittery. And I took that message. I'm like, damn right I did. <laughs> I was hoping that's what you're going to say. Damn right I did. Look how awesome I am. <laughs> right? And that's not to say that somebody bringing a leaf doesn't, is not as, um, as awesome as me creating this project because I like to create things with my hands and I lose, I, like, I always lose track of time. And that's why I, I try to limit the amount of time that I spend doing creating things with my hands because I forget to eat. I forget to drink. I forget to take care of my kids. That's when my husband was home. Like, I'm not lying here. Okay. I forget of, it's almost like I'm not human. Like I, I, don't, know, I don't know how to explain it. It's like, it's almost like I'm not human. I'm just doing and, and creating. Um, and, and when someone brings a leaf and they have a very like, attached story to the way the leaf is, how different it is, how easy it crumbles and different things. I mean, it means a lot to them. You know what I mean? So that's why, but when I say that somebody brought a leaf, I don't mean that they didn't put the same amount of effort into it. They probably put even more effort into it than I did by going to find that perfect leaf, right? By writing a story, about that leaf by attaching a meaning to this leaf and chances are they probably still have that leaf yeah right and that person was a very creative artistic person that's that's the thing like everybody the creative process is sacred and that's something else i was thinking about as you're talking about the the work you did yesterday but the creative process is sacred and it's different for everyone and Mm -hmm. Also, losing track of time is very much part of the creative process. And it's amazing to me that you are able to balance motherhood and your coaching career and everything else you do, taking care of yourself with the creative process. Because in juxtaposition, I am a single woman with no kids and I surrender fully to the creative process anytime it hits and to and the- I wish I could do that right. yeah like I know it's, it's like the life of luxury to be able to put on my headphones if people are around and be like going in going into my inner world in my spaceship and taking off <laughs> yep 
anytime I want. And so I just have so much respect and admiration for you and anyone else who is balancing a creative pursuit with essentially a lot of level four energy. The, the yeah. concern for others, taking care of others, because while there are elements to my creative process that it co comes from the level four desire to take care of all, I can focus on that desire to take care of all without having to be interrupted by taking care of the, the people directly around me. Mm -hmm. I mean, of, of course, I, I <clears throat> do what I'm needed when I'm called in, in the physical world. Um, helping my mom, helping my grandma, help, helping the, the matriarch. Because <laughs> I know, because I know as a woman, seeing the way women are constantly on alert with that level four energy of intuiting the needs of others, even the way we, we move about the world and navigate, like I, it's, it's just different. We're always, we're watching, we're watching, making sure kids are safe and we're watching, making sure elders are safe. Yeah. We're all while navigating our own worlds. <clears throat> so it's, it's not lost on me that how much of our fair share of level four energy. And I know some men, this is not, not to generalize everyone. And I, I know there's a spectrum. It's just as a macro perceiver of energy, I see level four primarily falling on the shoulders of women because we do have that natural intuition. I, yeah. I think we all have natural intuition, but we've been programmed to be that yeah. giver um, and martyr. Yeah, we were made that way, we were molded that way, we were shaped that way. That's why our brains are a little bit different. Male and female brains are a little bit different. Women were made and created to be caregivers, which is level four. That is how a woman was made. A man was created to be a provider, to make sure that his woman and his children, his family are cared for, which is also a caregiver, but in a different way, right? In, in the way that is, allows the woman to, uh, in the way that it allows the woman to care give to the whole entire family or the tribe, right? That's why like if um, I watched uh, a couple of shows that they're like traveling shows, um, but um, what, was the, what was it called? Something engagement, extreme engagement. That was a really good show. Um, that's where I learned that there is, I think it's like an island named Yana. And this oh, I think I saw you post this on your yes. now when I was watching it, oh my god, I'm I'm washing dishes, right? So it's kind of like cleansing. That's what I call it. My my washing dishes. I like to watch certain shows that kind of help um the process. And um so she comes on because this woman she's been wanting to have a kid that she hasn't been able to have a kid. So her fiance takes her to this island. Uh, to this tribe, this area, uh, it's called Diana. And this is where they, and it's about fertility, right? They, they are very fertile and they teach people how to become fertile. And you can go on this quest to go find out if you are fertile, if you're going to have a child or not. And that episode to me was so intense because the moment they said Yana, and all I heard was Yana, world, people fertile and to me it's like yana helps people to become fertile uh, but not in the way of having a baby but in the way of like having a baby having a baby right connecting and, and being and energy and all that kind of stuff and that's that's what i heard for me and i just broke down crying i'm like oh, thank you thank you thank you right to me it was a message Right? Because I was at a point where I was like, what am I doing? Right? What am I doing? What am I here for? What am I doing for these people? Because I feel like I'm not giving enough. I'm not doing enough. I'm not helping enough. I'm not enough. 
right? What I'm doing is not enough. Am I doing enough? And that's what I heard. I heard, Yana, you are doing enough. You are fertilizing the world. You're making the world fertile one person at a time. You can't impregnate everyone with their ideas at once. It's one person at a time. So you are doing enough. Just continue doing it. <laughs> right? Um, we get our messages different ways. Mm -hmm. That's what I heard. Was that what the episode was about? <laughs> it wasn't about me. <laughs> but I made it about me because that's every, the, there's certain things I was hearing that were for me because I mean I, I don't hear my name very often and when I heard it Yana and that name was said a couple of times and I'm just like oh 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 <laughs> that one's pretty obvious though like I know sometimes when we perceive messages which if we're open to them, if we're expanded to the frequency at which we understand that these, that everything is message for us to follow or not follow. Mm -hmm. um, like for the, for, sometimes they're subtle. That's a pretty obvious one to have it be your name, you know? And um, I think sometimes it's hard for us to give ourselves permission to hear the messages and because it is our intuition, like we feel it. Whoa, the weather here is wild. Um, we, our intuition feels it, and then our heads are like, again, gremlin, like, who do you think you are that that message is for you? And, but that one is pretty obvious, like your yeah. name. <laughs> for me, the gremlin did not show up, not even once during that episode. I, and, like, yeah. Not even once. And of course, that's the whole point of being the observer because the observer is not separate from what is being observed mm -hmm. so all this work we're doing it's for the sake of understanding that connection between what we observe and what it, the messages we receive from from what it is we observe yeah. and then we're going to get, gather a bigger web yeah honestly i i started watching this show because um i am i'm gonna put in one sentence i am a very big dreamer when it comes to traveling and seeing the world um and seeing the nicks and cracks of it like places that are small that you might not see in the map old ancient civilizations where people are still living visiting the tribes connecting with them um and i love watching that stuff because i feel like i could never do that myself um for me it kind of brings up a lot of as much as i would love to do it it brings up like fears uh fears and worries of like going to a place in the middle of nowhere um what if something happens right what about your kids you can't go places without your kids you can't abandon your kids what if something happens to you then they're going to be motherless um and that's what happens when you have children for me that's what happened when i had children i mean i used to be fearless i used to do things that now thinking back wondering like how did I even survive it um I'll give you one example as um as a kid uh back in Russia there was like a, this river a fairly fast river uh going under a bridge where the cars would pass and it was a light post on this bridge so a bunch of kids uh jumping off the bridge into the river um and I wasn't a very very good swimmer but I, what I did I climbed on top of the light post and I jumped off the light post into this river. And I mean, I was scared jumping, of course, but I did it anyways, like fear did not stop me. And now thinking back, I'm like, you couldn't even give me a million dollars to do that because I'm like overtaken by fear. So as much as I would love to travel and do all those things, a lot of fear comes up for me. And if I was on my own, I would do it. But because I have children, I don't see myself doing it entirely. I, 
I think, I believe, and I would love to one day still do it. But that's where, that's the reason why I watch this show so I can, I can learn, I can enjoy through other people's experiences and their eyes. And one day if I do go, I will be visiting that Yana place. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's, it's helping me to add things to my, uh, uh, this dog is like trying to get comfortable. No, 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 you're, you're not going to jump on my lap. Uh, <laughs> um, so that way I can add it to my bucket list. Right. That's what it's about. Like watching these things, learning these things. So I can add it to my bucket list and see if it's what I want to do. And I mean, part of uh, the messaging that I was getting from that is I can, I can go to these places and, and seeing how comfortable these people are talking to people that don't even speak English and getting things and being interested in like, you see this dog? Okay. I'll, I'll move the paper. Come on. Oh, my God. Her ears. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> trying to get up to bed and on my lap. <laughs> I mean, in, in the meantime, just empath to empath, like Claire gifts to Claire gifts. Um, I know just from our conversations throughout for over a year now, I know you have some really strong clairvoyance gifts of clairvoyance and and you have developed a really strong meditation practice and oh my god I want to hold a dog right now (laughs) that looks so nice um so I just in, in the meantime those feelings of travel um I just know I know you're able to cultivate them from within yeah i honestly i was even thinking that i don't have to even leave my house to travel exactly and i know that when time comes it's like with this bed right with doing um with staining my son's bed i knew that i was gonna do it when the time came he's such a sucker um, I knew I was going to do when the, when the time came, when it was the right time. And the same thing here. It's like when it will be the right time, I will just figure it out. I will spend the time and I will learn and how to travel without leaving your house, how to go and enjoy these vacations by myself <laughs> in here. Cause that, I mean, when we go to a place, when we travel somewhere, yeah, we, we're in physical in a different place, but some people can still mentally be in their house. Exactly. Like it doesn't necessarily being there physically doesn't necessarily mean being there. In Eckhart Tolle's Power of Now, he there's one part where he talks about like you could be on a um like in paradise and then still ask, okay, what next? So yeah. uh, you're enjoying it, right? Because you're not in the moment, but when you travel in your mind from your bed, you're actually traveling and enjoying it. And you can experience a, a week long travel in, in minutes, like taking a whole week of experiences of what you could do when you go like a paradise, let's say, um, I like waterfalls. Okay. in the place where it's like, everything is green. When I say everything is green, I mean, like I see moss. I'm like dead, um, dead logs it's covered in moss there's moss growing up on the trees there's moss all around when i get out there's moss even like where the waterfall is right because the water is falling from moss like i I love moss it's just so like it's like a natural carpet that's what it is oh my god i love it and walking on the feet right and then you're sitting there and the water is not mossy it's not green it's crystal clear and 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 see through and blue and white and it's really nice and just sit in there and the water is really warm because in reality it wouldn't be really warm um i'm gonna let my dog out because she hasn't even been to the bathroom all day okay i'm gonna open the window so you can see this wind is that bob marley (laughs) 
<laughs> That's Bob Marley smoking a J. Oh, like it. I like it. I like it. <laughs> but anyways, like traveling, right? Like what I've just described, that is a place. That's my paradise. Yeah. And near that paradise, there's also um, a forest, right? With um, a theater. Okay. Theater technique. Uh, so that's where my theater is. Um, Cause this is like a waterfall and then a river, <laughs> right? Where the kids can play as well. And then there's a field of beautiful flowers. Um, at first the field was full of lavender. Now I've seen other flowers that I like. So it's like purple and orangey flowers. I'm not sure what they're called. Uh, so it's like a field full of these flowers. And when I'm there in my, in my time during the theater technique, I, I have my dogs. I have two dogs in there. <laughs> so it's Vahiti and another dog running around playing with the kids and they're splashing in the, in the river. Um, and then the, but the river is also ice cold because it's coming from the mountains. So doesn't really make sense, but it does in, in my mind. Um, That's perfect for Wim Hof. <laughs> you can do Wim Hof in there. So I can just die right in there. <laughs> and me just having a conversation, or just not, not having a conversation, it's like having a conversation with my partner, with James, without using any words. Just like standing my, my arm around his like, uh, he's under chest because I'm short <laughs> and then his arm just like on my shoulder because he's tall um, and just standing there and taking in all the smells of the ice cold river that's coming from the mountains I don't know if you guys ever smelt it I have and it's oh I still like I, I, I miss that smell uh, back in Russia we used to travel a lot with my parents and just admiring the dogs running around and playing and the kids running around and playing. And there's my fruit tree growing over there. Sometimes it's, uh, it's peaches. Cause I remember back in Russia, my mom, uh, my dad, they had this uh, kind of like a, I guess it called a cottage or something, um, where we were given a piece of land and you can put a house on there where you can grow your stuff on there. And my mom, I remember, um, there was a peach tree and she took a peach off that tree and it was so big she bit into it and my dad was filming her this is when the cameras were like brand new um and the peach was just like so juicy and it just ran down her face and like she was like oh, and just kind of like kind of like shy and uncomfortable a little bit with this peach but it was so juicy and so tasty because they also grew it themselves right so there was a fruit tree growing there. But I mean, this is like what, what, what I'm describing here is a way how we can travel in our minds and experience it, adding that fruit into there, adding that ice cold water into there, adding that moss. Because if you ever stepped on moss with your feet, you know how that is. The best. <laughs> That's like bringing in all of your senses. So this is like a kind, of, kind of like a, a mini crash course and how you can travel from your home, close your eyes, just play some music by neural beats or some, uh, some water music, whatever will help you to trigger. You know what I've been using lately? And where it takes me. Um, I, I've been using these shamanic drumming playlists and yeah. whew, like I'll, um, I can, I, I think from having practiced the theater technique so many times, I can get somewhere within a, a split second. So um, I'll hear this like tribal rhythm. It's like, oh, and lately the didgeridoo, like the sound of the didgeridoo. Um, I'll hear that and the, the tribal drumming. And I am immediately around a campfire with, with all these other like beautiful mystical beings and empaths and wise old sages and um so that's that's where like I realized that the uh over time it changes like where I began with the theater technique was very different from where I end up traveling now but yeah shamanic drumming like if, if you want to get back to uh tribal setting and like see that yeah. fire and like see our outfits and like you know it's just wild like that wild surrender that that we used to worship 
it's just like this feeling of worship of that like that rhythm it's a natural rhythm like to me it's almost like beating of a heart yeah that was, that was it's like the the heart and mother earth like mother earth's heartbeat mm-hmm. and our heartbeats like um coinciding harmonizing um like getting on getting on her frequency there's also meditation like that's, what, that's what i'm gonna do when we get off this call I'm gonna <laughs> you're like I, I know what i'm doing next <laughs> like i want i want that uh, <laughs> but yeah i mean that's that is something ancient that i travel to and then when i come back to present i know yes this this is what i'm going to cultivate somehow someday i will be around a tribe with my coven sisters, with my witch sisters, maybe some men, depending on how it, how evolved they are and how respectful of the okay, they are, yeah. How how respectful of the surrender and the sacred container, because in order to surrender like that, we need the safe sacred container in which to be so vulnerable. Because when our spirits are, like when we are off with spirit, our surroundings um our surroundings can disrupt that like we are in another world (laughs) we're Mm -hmm. fully in the spirit realm so the physical world the safe sacred container we have in the physical world has to be secure enough to hold that it's like the this holding my cacao without this the cacao would go everywhere so um so that is what i i have there was a time when I couldn't envision any men in this sacred space, but now I'm seeing more and more men who have done the work and who have reconciled with their own inner feminine energy. So because they have, they value that surrender so much and that sacred container. So I do see men there, um, a few, but <laughs> that's what I, it, combining that, that past, present, future, um all at once like i'm experiencing it in the present it's from the past and it's something my soul definitely remembers from the past while i'm also creating the blueprint for manifesting it into the future yeah that's that's how i experience past present future simultaneously that kind of that kind of moment mm-hmm and I yeah. think we all like when we are drawing on our senses to do the theater technique, like you mentioned, the peach, that's from the past. So I think we all are experiencing past, present, future simultaneously without realizing like where everything's coming from. Mm-hmm. Like my, see, that peach, I get to taste it. Like the vision that I have when I'm doing the theater technique. Um, I see my mom in that moment, but I'm the one that's tasting the peach. Mm-hmm. You're tasting it in the I'm not my mom, even though I am my mom. Um, lately, I'm noticing a lot more of my mom and me. <laughs> um, After, yeah. yeah, so anyways, um, but I see my mom and in that moment, how I see her right and I, I, I feel her, I see her. And I am her in that moment. So even though I'm watching her and I'm watching that moment because that moment is, I mean, I, I can't even, I can't even explain it in words because that's how I see my mom, right? As that sweet, gentle, young woman who has not yet gone through all the difficulties. And so now I'm gonna, I feel like I'm gonna cry. All the difficulties of coming to Canada. She didn't know what was coming in her direction. You know what I mean? And it was not easy. One day I might share my story. (laughs) I just need to make sure I don't get looked up after of how we came to Canada. But anyways, um, she's gone through a lot and that changed her. So I see her as that young, innocent, strong sweet woman eating that peach and enjoying that peach and being in the moment that's what i think it is she was in the moment and she was enjoying that peach 
and I get to be her and I get to experience her in that moment by being a part of that, by being in that moment myself, in her as a part of her and at a distance, right? So, and I mean, our mothers, like, they don't, they didn't know, I don't know even if my mom or when my mom ever gets to watch these things. Um, all I gotta say is, I know how difficult it is being a parent and how difficult it is trying to stay sane and trying to keep you cool and trying to teach your kids all these things that we want them to learn. And at the same time, I know now that they will learn their own things. And whatever I want them to learn is rarely going to be what they're going to be learning. So in saying that, we each have our own journeys. We each are going to go through different lessons. And if I snapped and lost my shit of my kids, they needed it. Not in a way, I don't mean it in a way it's like, oh, I, that had to happen. They needed to be punished. I don't see it that way. I, need, I see it as don't beat yourself up, Yana. You didn't do anything bad. You just, you just gave them a gift in a way. And again, I don't mean go and lose your shit on your kids. But I mean is that once in a while, if it does happen, don't beat yourself up for it because they're learning through your flaws. Because I express my flaw. I see it now. I don't like it. They're going to learn from it. They're also very resilient. They're going to forget about it, chances are. But I will remember it. So now I see my flaw. It's in front of me. I get to look at it. I get to be reminded of it. And I have a choice of how I want to go about that flaw, right? What I want to do about it. And I then decide which way to go about it and what to do about it and what not. Yeah. I, I, I see it as a total teacher, student, on both sides situation and maybe in right after it happens, right after you, you lose your shit, it becomes, you become the student. And then, yeah, in, you know, in, in the future, if, when the a child becomes an adult and is looking back at the lessons, then they become the student. And yeah. so when stuff like that happens, I just assume it's woven into the soul contract. Like when I lose my shit, when, you know, I'm, I'm quarantining with my parents and I think I told you, yeah, I told you, <laughs> told you last time about my level one, level two day, yeah. you know, I lost my shit and I was like, I'm going to, you know, like the reaction was in in case uh, anyone didn't see it last time, I basically compared it to my mom, like crying to my mom, like an angry cry, like yelling cry, um, comparing how someone else treats me versus how I felt by saying, this person values me. This is what this person says to me. And you all don't, you know, and... Um, the intention there is to make basic, basically what I was projecting was you're not good enough. You're not treating me well enough. Um, and afterwards I was like, shit, like I'm the, I know all this shit. I'm emotionally mature. Like I'm the one who has access to all the seven levels. I should have just stuck with five through seven I was beating myself up for a minute and then I remembered, you know what? This was all, what it, it all happens for a reason. I chose that moment when I signed my soul contract. Like your, your kids chose you losing your shit on them when they signed their soul contracts and, and decided to in, incarnate on planet earth through your portal, your sacred portal. Yeah. Anytime though that kind of shit happens, like when we cross paths, when it happens with friends, with uh, romantic partners, like we, strangers, 
we all cross paths for a reason and, and it's all part of the, the, the grand design. Um, I remember someone talking about, listening to someone talk about an ayahuasca experience they had where at, they saw every stranger and every person who's, whose paths they've ever crossed. They saw, reached this moment in the ayahuasca journey where they saw everyone cheering for them like clapping for them like you did it you did it you did exactly what you're supposed to do yeah and so i i've just kind of taken even when we mess up or when we we judge ourselves for having messed up even though that's really not what you know from from that perspective of loving awareness there are we don't there are no mistakes only lessons to be learned yeah only only experiences they're just all experiences. We are the ones who attach judgment to them. So ever since I listened to that, I, about that ayahuasca experience, I just try my best to return to that, to return to even the people I hurt um, in my outburst. I'll try to imagine their highest selves being like, nope, that's exactly what you were meant to do because then I got my lesson. Yeah, and you got your lesson, and we're all getting get we're all getting the lessons, and that's the whole point of this entire human experiment. Passing on the lessons mm -hmm. and helping each other to learn um, whatever it is that needed to be learned in that moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also just realized that one of the things that I truly had been missing. And not so much anymore because it's been a while since I've already adjusted to everyone being home. Now I'm going to be like when they all leave and go back to work and school and be like, oh, come back, come back. And maybe, maybe they know, who knows what the future holds. Maybe we'll all be living on our tribe by then and have lessons, school lessons on the farm. Um, I think for school, uh, this school is going to be changed forever. Uh, but jobs, I know most people, like certain jobs are not going to be eliminated, right? Uh, like you can't get rid of a coach, will always have a job. I mean, uh, I think that where the, the mental health and spiritual health, um, I don't want to call it industry because it's not, I, I see it as more of a community, but I think it is going to well, be. Coaching is an industry. It is a career, right? I know some people might not agree, um, but it is. Yeah. It really I, is. Personally, my definition of industry, uh, I, um, like when I was more active in the cannabis community, Mm -hmm. um, and I'd be at events and people would come up to me and be like, well, what do you do in the cannabis industry? And I'd be like, this is it. Like I volunteer with my organization. Like, but how do you make money? And so I, I, um, which for me, it was never about money. It was about, I was very clear on my intention for becoming involved in the cannabis community. And it was to spread truth. Mm -hmm. and so for me the money was never the goal mm -hmm. so when people would come up like asking about what what my role is in the industry and how I want to how I'm supposed to make money doing what I'm doing it created my own disconnect with the word industry and I'm like maybe if I at, make, swap it with community um <clears throat> it won't have that same um attachment to it's not uh, valuable or worthy if there's no money coming in. Mm -hmm. um, and with coaching, yeah, I mean, it's such a growing industry. I think it's, I think it's quickly becoming the most important industry today because especially the kind of coaching that we're trained in, it's, completely dissolves any limiting beliefs that previous mental health practices were based in like the dsm um, Honestly, i would say it changes your life and it helps you to wake up that's how i would describe it and 
it helps you develop the tools to smash through your own blocks. And once you're smashing through your own blocks, you're unstoppable. Yeah, you truly become unlimited. Exactly. I have a couple of people that had reached out to me recently. Um, they had therapists after therapists after therapists. And um, they're like, I've been following you for a while, watching you for a while. Um, I can't do therapists anymore because mm -hmm. they just make me feel bad, make me feel guilty, make me feel shame. Oh. Um, sometimes I'll leave in tears. Um, and I feel like these are the words that are coming out from these people. And I feel like they're, uh, they're not even listening to me. They're not hearing me. They just don't respect me. They don't understand me. And I mean, isn't it there? I mean, don't, I, if I'm wrong, I, a therapist's job is to understand a person and to help them and not to break them further and oh, tell them there's something wrong with you. Oh, it, my heart is just so with the, the people reaching out to you because you know my experience with therapy and yeah. it was and I know there are amazing therapists out there who do um, work outside of the limitations of traditional therapy. We have two in IPEC right now that are learning how to coach. Mm. Actually, no, three. They were, they're all in my, in my group. So three. Oh, that that three. gives me hope because... Yeah. I have never felt so mentally unwell as when I, after that, that last session that I had with my therapist, when I was like, I'm not doing this anymore and cried to you about it. And, um, mm -hmm. I never felt that out of control of myself and that afraid of my own mind. Like she made me so afraid of my own, own mind because she was projecting based on what she had been taught. Mm -hmm. and had me take a standardized test um w and just as coaches we know that everyone is an individual and we all have our own set of intuition and she was not willing to hear my intuitive guidance she was not willing to hear how much i perceive and she instead wanted to project her own determinations of my experience instead of holding space for my experience yeah. and because of my perception I could perceive her attachment to my journey so when I set up boundaries she came at it even harder with call with mental illness with prescriptions and and that's when as soon as she said the words mental illness I was like and we're done here we have very two different definitions so of mental illness. Yeah. It sounds like so she has her own agenda. Yeah. I mean, she wants it to be, honestly, she wants it to be right. It, the whole time I felt like she had this ego struggle with me. And something we learn as coaches is not to put words in other people's mouths. Yeah. And when I was just venting to her, um, venting some anger. She was like, where is all this hate coming from? And it stopped me dead in my tracks because, and I, I was like, um, huh? I was like, hate? I was like, I've, I've never, I never feel hate. Like, I don't, what? And, um, she, and then I like felt her backtrack a little bit. And from then on, I could feel her power struggle because I, I caught her and she stumbled. And that's when I could feel, as soon as I felt that, I felt her attach. And week after week, she was not willing to give. She was not willing to give in to my own level of awareness of myself. She had her perception and that's all she was, she was going to stick with. But because she was not, um, she was nowhere near your level of perception, your level of I, I even explained to her the seven levels of energy and, um, but it, it just like wasn't going because I, and I trust her. I saw that in her office. She has 
the she had these affirmations for all the seven chakras and I was like oh she and I are, are gonna vibe well thinking that she's already achieved um kundalini awakening and um so uh yeah uh, what and then and then what I realized and af afterwards is um maybe not all therapy is conducive to the shamanic path or the mystic path because in everything i've read since everything talks about how when you are approaching that path or about to break through to the other side it feels like you're going crazy and the in the sane world is actually the insane world and it's there's a switch when you go through that membrane and so just realize, like, I was able to give myself a break, like, whatever, I'm a mystic. This woman couldn't vibe with a mystic because she's got her head in her books. And that's fine. That's her education. Mm -hmm. And again, I know there's so many amazing therapists out there who yeah. are more open. And I'm so grateful uh, because it did, my experience made me really concerned for empaths who seek therapy. Uh, because it is we are vulnerable when we're in that uh, with that therapist we are so vulnerable and they're the trained professionals so we're programmed to believe everything they say about us we're programmed to believe their interpretations of our experience but all it really is is an interpretation developed by who whoever developed the textbooks that they went to school reading when they studied how to be a therapist yeah yeah and I'm glad that you said that there are good therapists out there because I believe that there are many, many, many good therapists. And that's why um, we, even as coaches, sometimes we, if we see that a client needs therapy, we will see how open they are in going that route as well as still staying on as a client uh, with us as a coach, right? Because they are different there are different i'm glad you brought that up um yeah so usually when we would do that as coaches what we're really doing is helping someone to achieve radical acceptance for the present moment so that we can then focus on where we want to go from here we say yep this is where we're at where do you want to go and we move toward that whereas in therapy so we would recommend refer someone to therapy if they were struggling with radical acceptance for the past and if they were stuck in the past and we, and we aren't breaking them through. Um, we hold space. If the past comes up, we hold space for anyone who needs to release and, and vent. And, that, and we use our own levels of discernment to decide, is this person caught up so caught up in the past that therapy would be more beneficial or is this something that we can move through within a couple sessions and and focus on on where we want to go from here so I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up we do we do value and respect therapy as coaches and and we will mm -hmm. if need be um recommend make that recommendation it look this is um this is not what if it's not moving forward then it's not really what coaching is for yeah because coaching is about here and where you want to go therapy is here where did you come from right and, and well, yeah like why did it ha like like therapy focuses a lot on why things happen the way they happened whereas in coaching we're like well it happened what do you want to do about it now and um and what i have found is that that has helped me the tools that i have picked up in moving forward has helped me when the past has resurfaced yes. and i would have it in to be like okay so these past thoughts are coming up how's it making me feel shame guilt how's that serving me and you were working work. it yes yeah it's going to come up our past is ours and it's going to pop up it's like i'm just seeing this whack-a-mole game it's gonna it's gonna come up once in a while right you just need to know to whack it or to or to miss it 
right? You don't need to whack every mole because not every mole needs to be whacked. Sometimes the past comes up and it just, it, it feels insignificant. It's so little and we can focus a lot of energy and work through it, but in the end it's like, oh, I didn't even need to do that because it wasn't bothering me, right? But something else comes up that might be right. more intense, something that needs to be worked through. And we do provide that space. We're not gonna keep you in the past, we will help you to um, to see the lesson in that, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what was the lesson? That's what, it. That's what just it. For you, right? That, that and that's exactly what I think. Taking that radical acceptance for the past and present helps with the lesson reveals itself and then results in love for the dichotomy and appreciation for the dichotomy so that we can see if this thing from the past is causing me so much grief what's on the other side of that grief love and if this lesson from the past is causing me so much guilt what's my medicine for guilt action I'll do differently now I know better now and all that we have is the now so really the past is in some cultures they call depression ghosts and depression is comes from is a result of wanting to change things that happened in the past wishing that things could have been different and so that's just ghosts like the past is just ghosts and they have a lot of and really strong energy and mm -hmm. that radical acceptance for the now helps us to derive that lesson view the dichotomy in the journey value the whole human experience and then just choose differently and then now based on that feeling that it's bringing up like if something's bringing up so much guilt and shame and grief it's probably really important to like the um you know i've, I've talked about it before the grief that i experienced from not having been a better advocate for my musician brother when when I w began working with a coach and began believing in my true potential and then all the true potential of everyone around me, it, oh, it was amazing, but it opened up a flood of grief because again, that like, why didn't I do this in the past? Why wasn't I, I better in the past? So I, that actually, I didn't set out to become a coach as a career. I enrolled in coach training so that I would have those tools that when I'm around people, I could be that advocate for that creative. So that's what that grief, like it was devastating grief. Like I, um, I would imagine how lonely, how alone he must have felt not having an advocate for his creativity or his, his personal agenda. And it was the most grief, grief stricken I've ever felt in my whole life that I, was perpetuating the status quo in his face being like get a job we all have to get jobs and that grief was the map it's like well you can't change that that's what you did you did that yeah you you joined you joined in with culture and um but you can't change it and so that's why coaching is so amazing because it helps me to just rat like yep radical acceptance i did what I did because I didn't have the tools at the time to know any better. And now I have the tools and I can choose. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to choose, you know, I realized creativity is one of my core values. So I get to choose to align with that core value by being a creative, advocating for other creatives, dreaming up a world in which the scarcity is removed from the shoulders of creatives. Mm -hmm. Do, like if if the old paradigm story is uh the starving artist then the new paradigm story is the thriving artist and yeah. so that you know that's why it's like i don't i coaching helps you you don't it just helps you to understand why the past worked out the way it worked out without having to spend a whole lot of time there yeah and I love how you took something that was that created a lot of um, guilt and grief in you, 
and then turn it around and now you're helping other creatives to continue to create and motivate them in the ways that you know how. Seeing them yeah. that. I couldn't do it at the time. I didn't know. I didn't know any better. And now I do. And now I am a warrior for creativity. Mm -hmm. And I, I would have not known. Had I not felt that grief, I yes. would have never known how important this is to me. It, it became my mission, my sole mission, my life's mission, just a champion mm -hmm. for creativity, however it comes out of me. Yeah. And coaching, I, I didn't even know that I, well, I hadn't admitted to myself then that I am a creative. I was focusing on other creatives at the time, which is why I was like, I'll be a coach. Uh, I'll, I'll learn all the coaching tools because then I could be around other creatives and, and use all these tools, coach their gremlins and shatter their limiting beliefs and smash their interpretations that are holding them back. And um, <laughs> I didn't know that I had my own inner creative that wanted to, wanted to write. And it mm -hmm. was on a call with my peer coach and from IPEC and uh, she came out on that call that I am a writer and I remember crying like I don't want to be a writer <laughs> but, yeah and then I became and then I learned how to, how to champion my own creativity so yeah had it not been for that like there's a reason that I experienced that level of grief for yeah. having blocked another person's creative creativity and creative path mm -hmm. and I'm grateful it's the best like that it's the best teacher yeah that that like that like that depth of grief has has been my best teacher and our feelings right. and emotions right yeah. like your body is telling us something and that's what your body was telling you to feel it to understand it and then you learn the lesson um, and yeah. I believe that every single human being is a creative. I really do. Because I, it's... I mean, why else would we have, you know, why else would we have the sacral chakra? Yeah. We all got, we've all got that chakra yeah, vortex. I was just going to say, we all have it. <laughs> we all have it. And we're all, we were all kids once. And as kids, we were very curious and we were very creative. We found new ways to piss off our parents. That's very creative, <laughs> right? We found new ways to draw on the walls. We found new ways to, to even do our homeworks. We found new ways to do things. We were so curious and we're still that way. We just got distracted with being an adult and everything that comes with adulthood or with parenthood right because with with kids they hijack a lot more of our time so it's it's not just you it's not just you and your partner it's you and these two other creatures and those two other creatures can technically it's it's almost like i i remember um ethan's second birthday party we had a bunch of family members come over and some of them have never really met ethan and uh a couple of comments that were made by different people we're pretty much the same that he is like five kids in one <laughs> yes he is thank you for noticing <laughs> so technically sometimes like with us we might have two kids but i feel like we have five kids in total right because mila is two and ethan is three <laughs> three kids in one so it's it's a lot and i have to find different new creative ways to keep them entertained right mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm not sure where that was going, but we are all creatives. Mm -hmm. I think that that was just the point that I was trying to make with a few examples of us all being creative beings and how important it is for us to continue creating because if we don't, the word depression comes to mind. It's like when you don't create, you don't do, you just sit there and be and usually go backwards in time and you reminisce over the old stuff. I wish, I wish, I wish I could, I should have, and all of that stuff. And that's where you, you're not busy enough in a way, right? Because when you're being creative, 
Yeah. Or we future trip. It's either we're in the past or we're future tripping about what we could do if only we had the motivation to do it. Cool. The motivation is right here sitting underneath your butt. <laughs> just to lift it up. But it's just discipline. Yeah. But um, there was something else you started saying, and I, I distracted the conversation by talking about coaching being an industry do you remember you were about to say something and then we got we were talking about how coaching is different from therapy it was be it was right before that like i um i mean maybe it's not important but uh, when were they our conversation took the twists and turns in the back of my mind. I was like, I still want to know what Yana was about to say before I interrupted and was like... It had something to do with that um, we... Um, people still... So, okay. Oh, this is, this is what it was. Is that the coaching industry is... And this is why I call it the industry because, I mean, uh, whether there's financial gain or there's not financial gain in the beginning, there's not so much, right? Because a lot of the coaching we do, um, a lot of the coaching that we do in the beginning is for free to get practice, to get to get, to get get better at it, right? Um, and, um, and then it's just charging less and less. I mean, it grows, but I call it an industry because there's a lot of us in there. Right, a community I uh, would refer to more like if we had a whole bunch of coaches in there, we would would talk, and that would be more like a community. Uh, but industry is kind of like a career, coaching career. So let's move the industry word um, and call it a career. A coaching career is a career. A coaching career is a job. It's still a job. In in the beginning, I know for a lot of people, it starts as just fun and games. Right. And then it starts to become more serious as we become more, more tools, more skills, more awareness, more understanding, and it becomes something more to us. Right. I also it totally, depends, totally depends on the person. Like my module, I kind of went in just to learn the tools so that I could be a coach without people even knowing that I'm coaching them. And, um, but I, there were other people in my module who went in super serious, business plan mapped out. Um, they knew exactly how they were going to make this transition from their career into coaching with all the, the money coming in. So it completely depends on yeah. the individual and yeah. why they were called to it. Yeah. I, I went into the IPEC school already knowing that I wanted to be a coach. Um, and I took a different coaching program prior to it because I knew I wanted to be a coach, but I uh, originally, that's not how I got interested in coaching. Um, I was, and I still am with a network marketing company and just watching our, our leaders, our uplines talking and teaching and sharing. I'm like, I want to do that. Like, what are they doing, right? Um, because they weren't just selling products. They were doing their own thing on the side. It's like multiple stream income. And to me, it's like multiple stream income. That's some new fancy words I've never heard of before. What does that mean? So I started looking into it. And I'm like, okay. So for me, it's like my main thing is coaching. And then the network marketing. And then eventually it'll be like the blog and I know it should be other things, but you got to focus on one thing, build it and then go. You can't do everything at once because multitasking doesn't work. Right. And I know myself, I, it would be kind of like the bed. It'll take me forever to get it done because <laughs> I'll get distracted by other shiny objects. I mean, when you find, when you find your, what inspires the discipline, clear, inspired action, steady focus on, on one path is the most fruitful mm -hmm. way about it it's like the is it michael lewis who talks about ten thousand hours like spending ten thousand hours on something yeah and you become an expert at it it's like kind of like that like it's i think we could all be amazing we're all amazing multitaskers obviously because we're all human beings <laughs> at this <clears throat> advanced stages of our species mm -hmm. and we're 
everything at our fingertips. So obviously we're amazing multitaskers. Um, and, but being, I, it, the quote comes to mind, jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah. And I, and law being is a self mastery program. So you and I have both <clears throat> understand mastery. Like we both feel what that means. And I think we both experience that desire to be a master mm-hmm. in, yeah. in whatever it is we pursue. Yeah. Oh, definitely, um, right? Huh? Definitely, we all want to be masters in something. Um, and for each and every one of us, it's going to be a, something different, right? And that's the, the hardest part. It's just figuring out, uncovering what it is. And yeah. that's where coaches come in. We help you uncover. And then that's- it's theirs, like, gem at the bottom of the cave that we're excavating. And it's like, there it is. Yeah. We've known all along. You just need some... Some coaches to help shine the flashlight. Um, so just looking at the time, should we wrap it up in about five minutes? Yeah, Maybe we're just gonna o'clock? say. Yeah, because I also have to go pee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to defeat myself here. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, say like the brick, yeah. Having to pee is so weird because the brain's like, I'm kind of focused, but like 90% of my focus is on having to pee. We both know this. Yeah, about 60% now because like 60%, 60% here, 40% there. It's like, hold it on. Yeah. <laughs> it's natural, ladies and gentlemen. Like, I mean, we all have to pee eventually. I mean, anyone who's been watching these knows how often you and I talk about bodily functions by now. So. Yeah. Just reminding each and every one of you that we also go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I know they don't do that in movies, but humans go to the bathroom. Yes, yes. <laughs> we'll bring you with us when we go, but we go. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, should we come up with an assignment? End it with an assignment? Um, sure. Um, I honestly would like to hear grandma messages. I was thinking the same thing. I want to hear gremlin messages too. Yeah. And maybe maybe we can <clears throat> do some work with them. Mm-hmm. Them up and, yeah. I was yeah. thinking the same. Oh, same page. And the gremlin message usually is some form of not good enough. That's when you know that it's a gremlin message. And it all boils down to it's been yeah. not enough. I'm not enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that will be the the gremlin homework that we would love to see down below. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna go pee now. <laughs> Not now, but like <laughs> after you move to your throne. <laughs> yeah. Once I'm able to get up and move without pee myself. <laughs> Just honest here. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, thank you as always. This is so much fun. Yes, always. <laughs> and thank you to everyone who watched. Much love. Be safe, yes. everyone. Be healthy. Yes. I'm still practicing to do that. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye, everyone. Bye, Rachel. Bye, Anna. Bye.